Hi! Happy Flat Files time, whatever day of the week it happens to be. I'm Chrissy, this is Kyle. If you love hearing inspiring stories of taking your fourth year undergrad performance art project and turning it into a lifelong career, then this is gonna be a great episode for you. We talk with Bay Woodyard and we discuss honey pie hives and herbals that she has been working on with her partner Gavin since that performance art project, and also this new journey into natural dyeing, the spinner's world. We talk about gills and we talk about yarns and how you can buy bulk wool and turn it into yarn in your own backyard. So lots of fun information about yarn and just inspiring conversations about working in the fiber arts. As always, if you find this video uh, helpful, if you enjoyed the conversation, you've had a good time here, you could like, you could subscribe to our channel, you could share this video with other people who are nerdy about yarn and wool and dyeing, or you could maybe also think about becoming a member of our Patreon page. We hope you enjoy. Hello, my name is Bay Woodyard, and I um, work in a lot of different mediums, but lately I've been mostly working with textiles and specifically natural dyes. So I've been doing a lot of dyeing wool and then knitting things out of wool, but also dyeing fleece from sheep and spinning that hand spinning and then knitting and a little bit of crochet too. Oh my gosh. I think I'm really curious about like uh, how and why. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like general <laughs> overarching how and why. Well, I feel like it might be important for people that don't know like your background. Like you own and have been running um and like an organization that focuses in like the natural world for a very long time. And I'm assuming that was like the building block to this space. So maybe we can like just go back in time okay, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> so um, our company is called Honey Pie Hives and Herbals. So we do things that have to do with beehives and herbal products. So the herbals part is my part of the business. And my husband, Gavin, does works with the beehives and makes things out of honey. He makes wine out of honey. So I have always been into plants and doing different things with plants, making crafts out of plants. And ever since I was a kid, I've been doing stuff like that. And I actually used to work at a kid's camp as the craft leader. So I did natural dyes with the kids at the camp. So when I was a teenager, we would, we would get the kitchen to save onion skins. And then we'd have like a giant pot of onion skins and kids would bring their underwear and socks <laughs> to the craft class. And we tied up. <laughs> So that was like when I was probably 16, 17, I was doing that. I, I really don't remember how I learned how to do it. Like I, I was mordanting, like you use a chemical to treat the fibers in order for them to accept the dye or it just washes out. Generally for most natural dyes, there are exceptions, but normally you have to treat it with alum, which is a salt, an aluminum salt that you can buy at a health food store or a bulk store. And people used to use it in pickling. So it's, oh, it's okay. cheap. It's common. And I learned this as a teenager from a book, I guess. And I just <laughs> just started doing that with the kids at camp. And we actually did things like we would go in the woods. There was like a cedar forest that was planted. So there are all these cedar roots that were kind of growing on the surface of the soil. And we would just take a few roots here and there. And then we made a dye out of that. And that was oh. amazing. It was like a peach color. Oh, weird. Like That's so nice. Here. Yeah. So did you like continue like that interest or did you, cause you like went to OCAD and then you started like did, honey yeah. pie. So like, were you always like, Oh, that's still something that's like jingling around in my head that I would really like to go back to. Or was it like yeah. you sort of stepped aside and then decided, you know what? I might dive into that space again. No, I've always been interested in. So with honey pie, what I've done is um, I started when I started out, I, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the beginning of Honey Pie was... I love to like brace yourself for the beginning of all of this. Okay. Yeah, okay. It was a performance art project. There's a performance art festival in Toronto called 7A 11D. And I was in the first year of that, which I think was 1998. I, I was performing in Trinity Bellwoods Park. And I recreated a traveling medicine show. So I was... At that time, I was just studying what was a traveling medicine show and the like the label designs. I was really interested in the artwork and sort of like the performative aspect of selling things that it was more about the label than what was in the package. So 
because that's what it what at that time in the turn of the century in the 1900s um it would have been like just anything they could put anything in that bottle and it didn't matter what it did but i was interested in putting something inside that actually was useful and did something but also you know focusing on the packaging so i wanted mm-hmm. to do all of this all of the things of course so yeah, I, in your last year of school that's that's your ambition yeah. level all of the things <laughs> all of the things <laughs> And make it about plants. So I made all these products and I designed all these labels and I built a cart out of like a door and some table legs and an awning and bicycle wheels. And I was pulled around by topless men wearing kilts. because do you have what, I do. They're on my website. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> in the about us section. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was like, it was like the most ridiculous like I was led by a bagpiper who was like piping me through the park and I had hatched out these ducks from with an incubator and I had them on <laughs> golden leashes. <laughs> wait, this, wait, this wait, like <laughs> what department were you in? <laughs> I studied fine art. <laughs> but I was always a little <laughs> more in the experimental section. <laughs> the performative arts hand, this sounds like oh a great project. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> I yeah. didn't know about the ducks. I didn't know about the ducks. Ducks is a bonus, right? <laughs> I know about everything else. The ducks, I had not heard that part of the story before. Yeah, their names were Sunshine and Buttercup. And they were they were like pretty well, that was the thing. A traveling medicine show had to have an animal or a dancer or something to attract ah, people okay. to. <laughs> so that was one of the elements that I researched. And I just happened to have these ducks that I so I thought, okay, well, I'll bring them, see, see how that goes. They weren't trained to do anything, so I just gave them some watermelon to eat. Well, I was in the cart, so they just were sitting there eating watermelon and quacking. <laughs> and I sold everything that I made. So it was like a huge success. And then from there, I thought, well, maybe I should just keep making more things like this. So that was kind of the start of Honey Pie was that performance. And it was a lot of the things I made for that performance I still make. So herbal tea, lip balm. The, but the textile dyeing was not part of that, right? No. At the same time, when I was going to art school, I supported myself by selling knitted and crocheted hats. So wherever I went, I was always like making a hat because I was really like uncomfortable talking to lots of people at once. So I'd be like just sort of making things and hanging out in the bar, making things with people. And people would always ask me what I was making. And then they would like, I would knit whatever or make whatever people wanted. So I would like take their idea and make it into something for them. So that was that's what I did for work in my sort of last couple of years of art school. Oh, that's so fun. I feel like I can imagine you in the bar like knitting and people being like, I want whatever's happening over there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Pretty funny. I think what happened was Bill Steerman, who lives in the county and used to have a sheep farm, um, gave me a spinning wheel several years ago. And he just said, I think that you need to learn how to spin. And I just kind of stuck it into my room full of craft supplies and art supplies and forgot about it for a little while. And then at some point I decided that I would join like the spinners guild in the county and ask people to teach me how to spin. So that, that then started like a whole bunch of other projects that I've been working on. So once I, once I kind of knew a little bit about spinning, then I wanted to branch out and try different things, making different things. Maybe. What is a spinning guild, and how do you find a guild? Yeah, we the... we mentioned guilds in our one art discourse, I think. Yeah, I'm curious to hear like what the spinning guild is like. Okay, so it's um it's actually called the County Spinners and Weavers Guild. There's one in Belleville as well. There's there's no shortage of them in Ontario locally. There are lots of spinners. It's Bill was the exception. He's the only man that I've met that spins. The rest of them are women. And I'm almost 50 and I'm the youngest person that in the group. So it's, there's like a lot of knowledge there and people have been spinning for many years and are often they've taken like these master courses where you learn how to spin every type of fiber imaginable. And they spin like the most beautiful yarn you can imagine. So I'm just like a total beginner with it, but I'm interested in something that the spinners actually call it art yarn. So it's just like, it doesn't have to be perfect, basically, is the idea behind it. It's just like thick and thin, and you can put like 
whole like pieces of straight wool right off the sheep, which they call locks. So like they're sort of wavy and curly locks of wool. Um, you can add that. You can add like pieces of fabric or ribbons or anything you want. So I've been using like ends of wool that I I use like uh, wool from a mill that's already spun and I dye that with natural dyes and then I use little bits of that that I have left over to make the art yarn. Cool. Okay, so where do you even buy wool? Like, do you, do so, you go to like a, like, like Rose Haven or like, do you go <laughs> yeah. to a sheep farmer and buy direct from the source? I I've done both. So when I started, I went to Rose Haven and I would just buy anything that was undyed from the shop just to experiment. And then I started just like, I got a wholesale account with a wool company that you can order it and it gets shipped to you. So it's a bit more, um, it's a bit cheaper that way, but you have to buy a bigger volume. Right. Um, and what I found from the wholesale supplier was I could get organic merino, which is a really beautiful wool. It's the softest wool from a sheep that you can buy. And the trend in the last decade or so with knitters is to knit with merino because it's not as scratchy as the scratchy wool they call rustic, <laughs> rustic wool <laughs> and <laughs> or woolly wool. And that that's actually it's almost like going back to the rustic wool again. Like the trend is, is, has moved starting to move away from Merino to the rustic wool because you can get, it's like a terroir of with food, you know, you can get like specific wool from your specific area. So it's not all exactly the same soft fluffy oh. Merino that everyone has. So you can get like specific. So now I've started going to sheep farms in the County or just outside the County meeting the, the shepherds and purchasing raw fleece from them when they shear the sheep. And then I take it to a mill and I get it spun to my specifications. So like different thicknesses of wool, really fine and really thick and chunky and in between. And then I dye it with plants and I dye all different colors. The spinning parts, like, cause you have to like card it, right? Like it's like, looks yeah. like really intense hair brushes. Yeah, that's right. I don't really know what that does, but I'm assuming it sort of like straightens the fibers out maybe. So they're like more it separates usable. Them out what you want is to get all the fibers in the same direction like that. Okay. So when, when you have a fleece, the locks can be curly and it can get a little bit matted because you have to clean it first. So you wash it. So that's, I normally wash the fleece and then I send it to the mill to be spun. When I'm going to hand spin it, I wash it and then I card it and that like fluffs it up, but it also gets all of the fibers in the same direction. And then when you're spinning it, are you then spinning it again? Like if you want a thick wool, is that like many rounds of spinning? Yeah, it's like called flying. Spinning session? That's right. Yeah. So you spin what's called singles. So single ply, you spin that on the wheel by spinning it in one direction. And then you reverse the direction and you put together two or three strands or four strands of those single ply and you ply them and it makes it like a rope. You know how a rope is twisted. Um, so you're you're turning it in the opposite direction. So it kind of like opens the fiber up a little, makes it a little more fluffy right. when you, when you ply it. That's I've, I've talked to the spinners guild at the fair. I will say that like, if you ever go to a County fair, usually these guilds, like the quilters guild, I mean, at our fair, anyways, the quilters guild yep. is there and the spinners guild is there. And like, they are so excited to just chat about what it is yeah. that they're doing, which is how I knew about the carding because they were doing that. And I, and I didn't know that that was something you had to do. It's so, it's so labor intensive. Yes, it is. Yeah. So at the mill, I send my wool to a small mill in Alora, Ontario. They have a, a large machine that does that. Is that hard to like, are mills like, yeah, we'll take your small batch of wool and do the work for you. Like, or yeah. do you have to have a lot? Like what's the, I guess I would never picture myself doing that. Like I don't, wouldn't even know that that's a thing you could do. It's uh, the one in Alora is what's called a mini mill. So they will do one fleece. So you buy the fleece from a farmer, or if you have your own sheep, you could shear it. And then they will actually clean it. it. It's a fee to clean it. So that's why I clean it first to save a little bit of money. And then they, they card it and spin it. So um, that in that way, I can try wool from different breeds of sheep from the county or from, you know, I get some from Campbellford that is really beautiful. I'm just about to get some more fleece from this woman, Grace, that lives in Campbellford. And her farm's called Shepherd's Hill Farm. So she is really specific about the, she breeds her sheep for their fiber. And so they have their, a certain type of sheep. She has Blueface Lester and Corydale sheep. 
bred together and they have really soft and durable wool. Whereas people that raise the sheep for milk or meat, they might raise other breeds that would be more suited to those things and their wool wouldn't necessarily be as soft. They might be more rustic. They might be more rustic, yeah. I love that exactly. word, rustic. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I just yeah. love the rustic farm sheep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scratchy. They're less ideal fibers to rub against your soft human skin. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they are like they they uh, they have a different drape. So when you make a sweater out of a rustic wool, it's um, it's like, It's a bit stiffer, yeah. Which is actually like better for if you want structure to your garment. If you don't want it to just be like totally drooping and sagging, the merino tends to do that more. And they call it drape, but it's actually like it kind of doesn't look as good in certain patterns. So if you like cables and yeah. bobbles and things like that, you want the more rustic wool sometimes for that. It depends. Like people have managed to get Merino to do anything, but the rustic wool really shines with texture. This is a whole world that like I've never really, like I have some questions. So a, a regular yarn unit from Michaels. Yeah. <laughs> how long would that take you to spin? Like to make that kind of volume, like to emulate what you could buy from Michael's, like. Um, well, presuming that it's wool, right? Um, <laughs> Should we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the spinning part, like I could probably do one of those balls of wool in like a, a couple of evenings. Okay. Okay. So it just sort of, it depends on like, like I usually do a skein of wool that I've spun uh like a fairly large one in a couple of evenings, not like a little tiny ball. So it'd be like a generous amount. This is all just so fascinating to me. Okay, so you get the raw wool back from the mill. Yeah. And then wash what it. happens? No, so it's already right. washed it. I feel like if you washed it then, would it turn into just like a ball and it'd be like a felted ball? Yeah, well, you, you want to use cold water to wash it so that it doesn't felt. And be gentle with it and don't stir it a lot. So just sort of gently wash it. It's the heat of the water that felts the wool? Uh, it's going from hot to cold rapidly ah. so if it's gradual it doesn't felt it easily and like some wool felts more easily than others okay okay so like i yeah. was saying like when you get the wool back from Alora, yeah the mill the little mini mill if you will uh what happens after that so when i get it back from there it's ready to use except for i i dye if it's white wool i dye it and if it's brown or gray wool i just sell it as it is okay so when it comes back from the mail, it's it's ready to use. Do you have any examples of what that looks like? Um, I do. Yep. Let's see. All of my oh, see that blue shelf. That's all local wool on the blue shelf. So I'm just gonna grab some. Okay. Yeah, that looks like more than what you get at Michael's. It's so pretty. I also don't even know how you make it into this little folded package. Oh, I can show you if you like. It's pretty good. Yeah, so this is this is gray wool. So I could dye, I could over dye this and it, it is beautiful, but it's also beautiful as it is. So wait, that's just the natural color of the wool. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's From a gray so sheep. lovely. It's yeah. so nice. I guess it's like more even than I was imagining. That's when you card it, it mixes all the fibers evenly. Oh, so oh, okay. it's a little bit disappointing if you see the sheep fleece and it's got like all these beautiful colors and you think, oh, I'm going to have this wool. that's like little bits of black and white and brown all mixed together but then when you card it it becomes very uniform so that's where like hand spinning you can control that a bit more you can kind of like not mix it as much as they do it like you said you can take like a little wispy curly bit and just put it in yeah. as that oh that's yeah. really interesting okay so then you get it's more like about your personal preference of what you want the yarn to look like it's, it's right. fun this one was white and i dyed it with onion skins so. Okay, let's walk through that process because I have done natural dyeing, but I, it was for, again, it was also for, was a kids for kids camp kids. and I was, it was like about play and I wasn't really you worried. You good success though. I don't know if they fixed very well though. Like, cause anyways. No, I think it was like. What is the actual right way to do it? <laughs> okay, so if you're talking about um, animal fiber, which wool is, it's different than vegetable fiber, which would be cotton or okay. flax or linen. I mostly do wool, animal fiber. So sometimes I do um, alpaca as well, which is the same process. So you just need alum for the animal fibers. And you just need basically about 10% of the weight of the wool in alum. So if you have 100 grams of wool, you use 10 grams of alum. 
and you dissolve it in the hot water and you soak, you clean your wool first. So you, I just wash my wool with some dish soap, just a little squirt of dish soap in some hot water. And as long as it's not going from hot water into cold water, it doesn't shrink. So you rinse it out in the hot water and then you put it into your pot that has the alum dissolved in it already. And you want that to be hot too. And then you put your wool in there and you simmer it and you want it to stay at about 180 degrees, not hotter than that. So you keep it at a simmer for half an hour and then I uh, let it sit in there overnight and cool. So it's just taking up as much alum as it needs from the water. You can reuse that alum pot as well. If you don't have to put 10% in the next time, you can go down to about 4%. Oh, okay. I, I just keep reusing the same pot um, for mordanting. So I have like a really giant stainless steel pot that I can put like eight or 10 stains of wool in at once. So then once they're, once they come out of there, they're ready to die. Okay. And so with like the onion skins, so I feel like you, do you just have like a million pots? Of, <laughs> because you have to also heat those up, right? Like you you have all these onion skins, or at least that's how we did it. So I'm, a, I'm, I mean, like I said, I think I watched a YouTube video, but like we like heated up a whole bunch of onion skins in water. Yeah. And then put the like we were doing shirts into into yep. that. Um, and you really real like we definitely didn't think about like um displacement. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so like the kids are shoving all their shirts into the, this pot that is not big enough to hold yep. both shirts and liquid. Um, so is it I'm assuming it's similar then, right? Yeah. Yeah, but a really cool thing that I discovered, uh, I don't know if you can tell in this one, but this one has like a tonal variation to the wall. So it's like pink, but some places yeah. it's lighter and some is darker. So if you want to do something tonal like that, you don't need a big deep pot full of the dye. This is, what did I use? This is from Matter Root. So Matter doesn't grow here. It's a tropical, like it comes from India, but you just buy powdered Matter Root and it's like a red dust basically when you get it. So I make my pot of Matter. And then I just put like a little bit in a shallow pan, like a, a little roasting pan is what I often use because it's kind of long, like a skein of wool. Put the wet wool from the mordant pot, like I rinse it out and squeeze it out. And then I lay it in the dye. And so then it just gets dyed like on one side and kind of sucks the dye gradually up. So it gives you like a, a range of color. That's so cool. pretty. I yeah. love that. So it goes from like the first pot, pot with like, salt it's not salt you said it was it's like aluminum salt. salt yeah it's aluminum it's salt. it's called alum and then from there it goes into another pot and do you have to like put it into a third pot to fix it or is it just like good to go no. after that the first pot is the fixative so i like i put the fixative on first it's like it's preparing the fiber to accept okay. the dye okay and so then it just dries and it's thumbs up yeah yeah you rinse it out some people they let it dry with the dye on it to sort of like absorb as much as possible and then rinse it out and then let it dry again kind of depends on how dark you want the color and right how much time you want to spend so how, do, how does cotton and linen uh differ from animal fiber you can use alum as well or you you do use alum but there's another step which is tannin and i get the tannins that i use from sumac so you can use twigs or bark or berries any part of the sumac leaves all the parts of the sumac ha are really high in tannins so you make like a, a vat of that and you soak, you just cold soak the fibers in there for a certain amount of time. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is where we went wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we didn't do that part. No. <laughs> yeah. That's the step that I, I didn't know about either when I was doing the kids camp. So <laughs> you get, you get more long lasting and intense color if you do that stuff. Otherwise it kind of like washes out a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there's um, like the fastness of the dye. Fastness is the word to describe like whether it fades or not. But there's color fastness, and there's light fastness. Right. So if it fades in the sun, that's one thing. But it can even change color just sitting on a shelf. And that's when, like, there's tons of stuff on the internet now about natural dyeing that that's totally false. As with all kinds of information on the internet. I don't know what you're talking about. The internet is only filled all with the truth. <laughs> People are really into avocado pits and skins for dyeing with, and it, it dyes like this sort of like dusty rose color, and then it turns brown over time. So it's it's not color fast. Like it looks kind of pinky at the beginning, and then it just sort of fades to brown. Yeah, we like. I think the thing we were doing with the kids was we had a whole bunch of things that we were like, "Do you think this will work?" And mm. we knew that certain things weren't going to work, like beets. 
Um, And so we were sort of like talking about like basically that, like how does dyeing actually work and like what is going to stay and what isn't going to stay, but also like just being playful and doing tie dye um, things in their kitchen, which is really fun. Can I see so many colors over there. I'm wondering, (laughs) can we talk a little bit about like, uh, like the, the natural dyes that you're like, these have been really like amazing successes. And like, you're saying some of the things that you can like get here locally and some, I'm assuming you're ordering from somewhere on the internet. Um, and has there been anything that you were like, I really want this to work. And it was just like, no, it just will not do it. Yeah. Okay. So a cool one is buckthorn. So we know buckthorn's invasive in the County and it like is horrible and has thorns. And if you get a thorn, it like, it's very irritated as well. So it's not that fun to work with. Um, but you can dye with it. So you can dye with the berries and they actually make, you know, the paint color sap green. Mm-hmm. So they make that color and it's, co- it's named at like, it used to be used to make that paint oh, color. Oh, really? Berries. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a European buckthorn. So it came here, you know, with the settlers and kind of took over. It's an invasive species, but the, the berries can be used to dye wool that color. And that's quite amazing. And then the bark can be used to dye wool. And you can get sort of a range of yellows, reds, and pinks and oranges, depending on the pH of the vat. So that's another thing is you can adjust the pH using, um, I use pH plus that people put in pools because it's easy to buy locally and I don't have to like order it online. So you can just buy it at Canadian Tire or something. So So what, like your, um, I don't know what, I don't know what that means. So (laughs) (laughs) So there's acid. And base. Yeah. Acid no, and base. The, I'm, those I'm with you on that. pH. Okay. okay. So, so base is the higher pH level. So if you raise the pH of the liquid in the dye, so we've like put some buckthorn bark in a jar of water and we're raising the pH above what water normally would be. Okay. And then letting that just sit there. So the higher pH will actually get a different color from the bark, a, a more interesting, like a more orangey color than just yellow yellow is the easiest color to get yellow or brown <laughs> brown so seems like an yellow. easy one to get most of the time that was my takeaway <laughs> <laughs> yes if you like brown you're in luck <laughs> yeah so what happens if you go the opposite way you make it more acidic um, like, does that just make it more brownie or it depends on the plant fiber so i haven't tried uh with buckthorn i haven't tried making it more acidic because that's not like from the instructions that I've been following, that isn't recommended. But it is recommended for cochineal, which is an insect from Mexico. Um, I have some cochineal. Please tell me you just have like jars and jars of dried insects. This Wait, is, my, is this, <laughs> this is my favorite thing that I've discovered through Flat Files. We met an art. We've met an artist through an emerging artist program where they have just jars of random insects, and I didn't realize that this is a thing you can purchase. But it's totally a weird thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I think as far as I know, cochineal is the only insect that's used in dyeing. But so probably I don't have all color. the insects. <laughs> yeah. So this color you can get from just using the pH that comes out of the tap here. If I were to add vinegar, it would make it more acidic and it would change it to more of a red color. Wow. Weird. Yeah. This is so, so fun. It's like science yeah. and craft. Yes. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Do you, do you know, like, maybe this is like too far of a question, but like in like a sciencey way, do you know why it does that color shift depending on if it's a base or if it's an acid? I am, I am studying that. I, I don't know if I can, I don't think I can explain it yet, but I'm, I have a book about it that I'm reading and it's called the art and science of natural dyes. Cool. And it's, uh, it's actually, I'm trying to remember it's written by two women and I think one of them is Canadian. And, um, I, there's a company in BC that this that has published this book, but they sell all like natural dyeing supplies. And, uh, yeah, they're like, they have schools where you can study, but I'm actually taking an online course starting April 1st. And it's like a two month intensive course with a woman from Cape Breton. And it's very scientific as well. So I'm going to be learning a lot through that. So the, the funny thing that she says in her intro is that you can choose a pantone color and you will learn how to dye that color what 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 i want yeah. to take this course <laughs> it's pretty cool <laughs> i haven't decided the color i want yet but i want to choose something that i haven't done before 
or that I've tried to do and I haven't been able to do. So like I tried to do, you know, like swimming pool turquoise mm-hmm. and someone asked me for that and I, I was not able to achieve that color. <laughs> so what were, what were your try- methods of trying to achieve it? Uh, well, I thought yellow and blue together would make it. Um, but I just didn't, I wasn't able to control the amount well enough. So okay. for yellow, I used goldenrod flowers, which grow here abundantly. <laughs> and then for blue, I used indigo. Okay. And indigo is another whole science that's like, we yep. don't need to get into that here today. <laughs> that's a different process than all the other natural dyes. Yeah. And it involves using a pH meter and like measuring the pH really accurately. So in that, would you, would you dye it in one and then like let it dry as that color and then put it into the second vat of color? Or would you have to go back to the mordant and then into the second color? No. What I would do is mordant first, dye it yellow. And then, well, it's still wet, but I've achieved, like I've rinsed it and I've gotten the color that I want. Then I would put it into the indigo vat very briefly so that it didn't turn a dark bluey color. It didn't override yeah. the yellow because blue completely. is more powerful than yellow. Gotcha. Well, and it also depends how many times you've dyed something blue in that vat already. So right. I was trying to use, like dye a few skeins of wool blue first and then just have it when it wasn't too powerful. I feel like I see a color back there that looks green. It's on the top shelf. So it's yeah. like sort of brown, then a pinky, then a pinky, then yeah. what looks like purple, and then like a mustardy color. That's the one. What is that? That <laughs> one is exactly what I told you. Goldenrod and indigo. That's beautiful. That's like, I love that. It's a beautiful color. It is not turquoise swimming pool color. No, but it's gorgeous. Yeah. I really like that one. So that's kind of what I was able to get with, with the method that I described. When you're like spinning your own yarn versus what you're getting from this mill, is there like a discernible difference? Like, can you, or is it like obvious when it's done on a machine versus when it's done by a person? For me, it is. (laughs) (laughs) For the master spinners, it's a little harder to tell. (laughs) Yeah. I know one of the women in my spinning group has a sock knitting machine, which I don't know if you've ever seen one, but they're really cool looking. And it's like a hand crank antique machine like cast iron and um like one of the coolest machines i really want to get one but the she was told that you can't use hand spun yarn with this knitting machine because it wouldn't be even enough and she was like well mine is perfectly even so she tried it and of course you couldn't tell the difference between her yarn and yarn from the mill so it worked but not everybody's spinning is that even so the sock knitting machine just knit socks it knits a tube. I okay. think I've seen this. It, it feels like uh, it's like a donut shape. And it yep. has like maybe a secondary donut. I'm not sure of the mechanics, but I think I saw like an Instagrammer who had one of these sock knitting machines. And yep. it, she hooked it up to like a cordless drill. So she would just turn it nice. on and it would just spin it. And she was just like, and the yes. tube's just pouring out now. <laughs> and you're like, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. You can just, you could knit like a room full of tube as long as you just kept putting yarn on it. They're super neat machines. The sewing world has some really fascinating machines. Yeah. 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 I think you have like a, I I do have a knitting machine, but I think that it requires like very thin yarn. I Mm. also don't know anything about knitting. I did one knitting project while I was in university in a sculpture class. um, And it was super fun. And that's basically where my knitting story started and ended. Right. Uh, Yeah. It's like one of those things where like, When I was a kid, I wanted to learn piano and my version of learning piano was like apparently just being like, you know, direct input, know how to play the most complicated piece ever right out of the gate. And when I realized that that was not how learning a thing worked, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I feel like (laughs) knitting was the same. I was like, oh, I can knit a scarf, but I want to knit like the most complicated, like Icelandic like cable sweater that has like buttons and maybe even like a built-in hood. And when I realized yeah. that like I couldn't pick up I a set a of needles <laughs> and immediately do that, I was like, this is too hard. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't know. It, it really, it's a lot easier now because you can watch videos. So like I try things that I don't know how to do all the time with knitting, like a pattern that I have no clue how they do it. And then if I just get to a part, I don't understand. I Google and watch a video. Mm-hmm. So it's different. Like, I feel like I'm tackling things that I never would have otherwise because of that. 
That is kind of wonderful. And you have like a subscription box type thing. Are you still doing that with the yeah. like knitting? Okay. Do you want to talk about, do you want to plug that a little bit? <laughs> sure. It's really fun for me because it's like mystery for them. So I can just experiment with whatever I have on hand at the time. And I don't have to, I don't have to know exactly what color it's going to be as long as it turns out a nice color that, I mean, I don't really hate too many colors. So yeah, I just dye things and mail them to people. And, and I have two for the yarn I have two different versions. Like one, you can just get yarn if, if you don't want to spend any more than just the cost of a skein of yarn per month. And then what's more popular actually is you pay a bit more, but you get like a little bit of other products from our shop. So you get usually like a bar of soap and a jar of honey or maybe a lip balm and a salve or something like that along with your skein of wool. So it makes it like sort of, and I do them on themes usually, like either everything's the same color or it's like spring or, you know, seasonal themes. And how yeah. often do you get the, the box? Once a month. Once a month. And it's, I'm just using it like a, a thing, like a app that attaches to my website where it charges them monthly and then people can pause it or end it whenever they want. So it like, you don't have to pay for a year in advance or anything like that. Right. And h- how much can you make with a skein of yarn? You can make two socks, two socks. Two socks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or a hat. Um, this is, this is a one skein hat. And this one is, it's like not a giant hat, but a nice hat yeah and the variegated yarn is pretty cool that's goldenrod flower and then the the black or dark gray color is from dipping one end of the skein of wool that's already dyed yellow i dip that into a pot of iron water which is like i use an iron pot and i put a little vinegar in to get like it it kind of takes iron from the pot into the water an iron pot is that a normal thing (laughs) Like a cast iron pot. Oh, cast iron (laughs) pot. Okay, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's normal for me. (laughs) Yeah. My niece, my niece is like, Auntie Bay is a witch and she has a lot of cauldrons and she's teaching me magic. Mm, Yes. Well, I mean, kind of. Like when you're (laughs) down in your shop, it there is like a little bit of like a magical feel. Yeah. I do have a lot of pots full of mysterious substances (laughs) substances <laughs> well, you're, you're transmuting things you're turning one thing into like a different color like for a yeah. kid that's like insane to be like this yeah. was gray and now it's turquoise yeah yeah hopefully turquoise hopefully yeah turquoise. <laughs> well yeah. Two, we will wait in anticipation for the end of that workshop when you reveal your perfect turquoise <laughs> yarn yes should we do some art shares yes i have a question though okay question. like is neon even a possibility in the natural dye world? Um, Great question. Very important. Yeah, kind of. like Because I love neon. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely get some neon looking yellows and greens. Yeah, I haven't seen neon pink. But I know if you dye with mushrooms, which is something I haven't really delved into a lot, but I am planning to, there are certain mushrooms that show up under black light. Oh. What? You dye your wool with the mushrooms and then it like glows in the dark. Weird. That's Not the cool. same as me, but it's pretty, pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Of course, mushrooms. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get the crazy blues? Mushrooms. Yeah, obviously. mushrooms do it. <laughs> <laughs> and lichen. Lichen is also used in dyeing and you can get crazy purples from lichen and all different colors. Is lichen, am, am I wrong in thinking that lichen is a little like not endangered, but like not doing super great in the natural world right now? Or did I invent that narrative in my head? It's, um, it's a little bit endangered and dyers, there's a lot of talk in the dyeing world about it. And so the common practice is to only use lichen from things that have blown down in the wind, like tree branches that have fallen. So you would never like scrape lichen off of a rock because it, it takes really like so many years for it to grow. Yeah. But if you're sort of careful about where you harvest it from, it's still acceptable. But like in Scotland, for instance, you know where they have all the wool and the tartans and everything. That's it used to be traditionally done with natural dyes, and one of their colors came from a lichen, and it got over harvested for dyeing and like scraped off rocks all the time. Mm. So it's not it's not really used as much anymore. That makes sense. Yeah, I didn't realize that lichen could become endangered. Yeah, but yeah, just because it grows really slowly. Mm-hmm. 
Weird. Humans are good at pushing the limits of pretty much everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're very good at We're that. We're like right to the edge all the time. <laughs> all right, let's do some art shares. Yeah, I'm yeah. so excited to see what you have to share with us, Bay. All right. Okay, well, I have actually sitting right here. I'm going to move the yarn off of her. So I have this piece that my mom made. My mom uh, was an artist, and she, she actually died... I'm going to say seven, almost eight years ago now, but um, she made this puppet. Oh my gosh. And her name is Fern. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not like a great puppeteer, so I don't know if I can do her justice, but hello. What is her face made out of? She's made from vinyl. Vinyl. I believe. Yeah. Actually, it might be silicone. It's one of those two. Some sort of rubbery, like malleable fabric. Yeah. I first like I was like, is she felted? But no, she's like, because she has such movement. So my mom sculpted her head out of clay and then made a mold. And then I believe that it's it feels like silicone. I think the silicone is like painted inside the mold. And then you peel it out. So it's it's just like a skin. And then you paint the the face the color that you want it to be. And inside the mouth is just dark so that it doesn't look too weird, weird. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it looks pretty weird though i gotta say <laughs> wait how, how did your mom know how to do this <laughs> she took a class <laughs> so, she wasn't um, like a puppeteer or something like well she took a lot of classes and she was really into puppets and my mom's an artist who worked in a lot of different mediums so she was a painter mostly but she also was really into textiles and also really into puppets and so there's um a festival called Puppets Up in Ontario every summer in August in, um, is it Almont? I think it's in Almont. It's just outside okay. Ottawa. Yeah. And they have a parade of all the people that have made puppets in like a series of workshops that lead up to the festival. So my mom would always like make a, take a course, make a puppet and then go in the parade with her puppet. Oh. That's so lovely. I really love the hair and the headpiece of this puppet. Yeah, This is a really yeah. well-made puppet. She has wool for her hair, yeah. so I thought it went with my theme. But she also has like some fringe that's, I don't know what it's made of. It feels like hemp or linen or something around the edge. And oh, then okay. some, like poppy pods and pine cones and milkweed pods. And then these little green satin leaves are in there too. And her buttons are poppy seed pods. That's so sweet. She's yeah. so expressive. Yeah, she really is. And she oh. has the rods for the arms, just like like a Muppety kind of puppet. Yeah. Yeah. On her little thumbs. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, Are you going to start making so puppets cool. at some point? Or have you dabbled? I have puppetry? made some puppets, yeah. I've made puppets, and Gavin, my husband, has made puppets. Oh, and that's we right. I feel like there was... There's a giant Gavin puppet somewhere. Yeah, there is a giant <laughs> Gavin puppet. puppet. Yeah, and he's hoping to to go to Puppets Up this summer with his giant puppet. That's the plan. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, a it's a really share. fun festival. I've never even heard of it. This is the first time. No, but There's a I lot feel going like, on there. I feel like the craft world has things like this. Like, they're, like these little yeah. hidden gems of like traditions that have been running for years and years and years. And unless you're in that circle somehow, you like that's the only way to know about these things. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the Spinner's Guild. Like you wouldn't know how to find it unless you knew a spinner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like investigated your way into that space yeah or yeah. you go to the fair and you talk to the ladies that are in a corner for some reason spinning in an arena I think yeah. that's like I was like in high school and I was like this doesn't make any sense to me like <laughs> why are they like sitting in the curling club surrounded yeah. by like kids crafts spinning yarn um and when you're a curious person you go up and say what is what is happening what is this yeah and then they're like let it's me tell you <laughs> yeah <laughs> Let me tell you all about it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the quilts at the Pick and Fair have been like my highlight. Oh, like, they're the best. I know the time Quilting that goes into a quilt. And like that whole show that they put on, on the fair is just unbelievable. Like yeah. quilters, fantastic. Props, uh, props off to all those quilters. That's a lot of work. Yeah. My mom was also a quilter. She did lots of things. And one of my other shares is actually a painting that she did. And it's an uh, acrylic painting. Um, fairly large it's about like two and a half by three feet and it's of um, the field on our property in sort of early spring so the snow's starting to melt and there's like 
little red dogwood branches growing and it's kind of neat to have it like hanging in, in our house and be able to look out through the window and see the field at the same time of the year. I feel this is something I don't, I don't remember who I was speaking with, but we were talking about flat files and like the idea of like sharing art. Oh, I was talking actually to someone that does a lot of art writing um, for magazines and publications and such. And I was talking about how it's so nice to talk about art collection and like purchasing of art or, or bartering art with artists, because I feel like the relationship to the work is always so different than like when you're, you know, working with like a collector or something like that, because there's usually a lot of like personal story, um, like integrated into why that piece is meaningful and how you got to have it and all of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, the fact that two of the shares that you have are pieces by your mom, I think like really exemplifies like that part of this particular series of interviews that I just really love. It's interesting to me because um, I'm the oldest of six kids and my mom was an artist, but also all of my siblings either have studied art or are practicing artists or have some sort of a craft that they do pretty seriously. It's, it's wild to think like that somebody, you know, just like our mom was so curious about everything. That was her sort of approach to everything was like, Mm -hmm. I want to know how to do this. What are you doing? I want to know just like you at the fair. And she would, she would just like go anywhere and decide she was going to learn how to do whatever people were doing. So she met a lot of, she was very extroverted too. And met a lot of people that way and like joined groups and like joined a quilting group and took these puppet courses. But she also would like have shows of her paintings in Ottawa annually and saw lots of paintings too. So she was like really active with like art and craft all the time. Yeah. Oh, so good. I think you have a third chair, right? The third one is my brother, my brother, Seth Woodyard, who is an artist who lives in Winnipeg. And he um I have several of his pieces the one that I chose is a pen and ink drawing of me nursing my son when he was quite young probably one year old and he so my brother helped us to build our house um which yeah, is you have a very meal. uniquely built house we have a handmade house yeah and it's kind of like a, a sculptural project that we <laughs> we designed and built but while my brother was helping us build our house, he was also like sort of doing a bunch of pen and ink drawings of things that he saw around. So I have like these drawings of um, like this little trailer that we used for our office while we were building our house. And it has like a tarp on top of it to keep the rain out. And it just looks like kind of crazy. But now it's the same trailer that we use as our store. Like when, when COVID started, we, we didn't want to have people coming into our house. Our store is normally in our house, which is where I'm sitting right now. It's in the lower level of the house. So we just put this little trailer outside the entrance to our shop and we put everything in there and it worked great. And it was, it was just like this thing that we've always had around. Yeah. Um, You guys have a little trailer too, don't you? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, We, we store things in it right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) it's kind of the name of like any extra space on our property has become just art item storage just yep, I get it's that. crazy how quickly you build up just stuff yeah yeah we have shipping containers for that <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense actually <laughs> yeah that. it's not a bad idea yeah <laughs> a really good idea <laughs> hadn't thought about it yeah oh my goodness it's cheaper than building a building so Oh, heck yeah. And that's actually a great point. Like I, I got very crafty with like our dark room and it's only like about like eight feet tall and there's about two and a half feet into like the ceiling. And so I have stuffed absolutely everything that doesn't have a home above our dark room. And ah. it is just a chaos of mess. It's mostly paint buckets from me, but yeah, it's mostly mural paints. <laughs> but, right. you know, it's stuff that like you don't want to throw out, but it doesn't really have a home. It's not something you access every day. So maybe I'll buy a shipping container. Yeah. Yep, just don't store your paints in the freezing cold. <laughs> yes, that is just, good advice. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I love how it sounds like you're coming from experience of that yeah. going around. <laughs> yeah, definitely, I've been there. Yeah, wouldn't do it again. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's wild that all of your family 
like went down the art path because I also had like an artistic parent and I went down the art path and Susie did not not that she's not creative in her own way but like not in like a practicing regularly creative like kind of like me and Kyle yeah 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 Yeah, it definitely takes a certain type of like um like comfort level with chaos I would say to pursue a life of creativity (laughs) that's the politest way of of saying that i've ever heard and i love that because it is such a chaotic world because it's there it's not cookie cutter it's like the furthest thing from like a nine to five job you can ever have yeah it's always crazy it's always different it's always unpredictable and like it is all self-motivated it is that's right yeah but i mean i guess if that's what you like it's worth it you know like you wouldn't do it if 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 it wasn't exactly Exactly. Own rewards. Yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. Does. Oh, this has been so lovely. I really yeah. like I yeah, now I just wanna have a bunch of yarn and I guess put it in a pile because I don't know how to make anything with it. Well, <laughs> do, you know, do you know how to make pom poms? I do know how to make pom poms. I've actually made okay. so many pom poms. Perfect. Yeah. That's they would be what... kind of expensive pom poms, but I did have a woman, a customer one time bought several skeins from me and said that she just likes to make pom poms. I was like, okay, <laughs> that's like, great. Put them in a, it's like a different type of pile of yarn. It's like yeah, a little bit exactly. cuter. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit cuter. Just kind of making that chaos a little bit more of a cylinder shape and then into a circle and into a sphere. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I would want to make like socks I feel like that's like where I wish that I could just make myself socks I could I just you don't could. have the patience it's a patience problem I I recommend taking a class through Rose Haven Yarn Shop for the sock knitting yeah I feel really like less buying a sock knitting machine <laughs> or or the machine yeah Clearly, or the machine the fast way to go yeah. apparently yeah. Like, I kid you not like the woman just had a drill and was just going and it was just like puking out a toque it was like <laughs> just so quick <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. I'll have to look that video. I'm up. I'm actually going to a fiber festival in Montreal uh, the first weekend in April, and I'm I'm busy now dyeing wool to take there. And I'm hoping I'm going to see the guy that sells the sock machines because he was at the last fiber festival I went to in Paris, Ontario. It's called Wool Stock. That one, the one I'm doing in Montreal, is called Knit City Montreal, okay. and it's just like all the yarn people in one place. How big are these conferences? Are they a um, conference or are they just a festival? It's, it's just like a, like a craft show. So it's two days. It's in a hotel in Montreal and there will be like probably thousands of people going to it. It, It's been postponed for the last two years. So there's a lot of pent up demand now. There's a lot of pent up yarn folk just wanting. (laughs) Yeah. Give me the natural dyed skeins. I don't want to buy them on the internet. That's right. I need to squish it first. Is it rustic or is it soft? <laughs> <laughs> Not rustic enough. <laughs> oh yeah, my gosh. Hilarious. This well, was such a lovely chat, Bay. Thank you so much for taking time today to chat to talk yeah. to us. Like, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to report back on when it comes to like the scientific part about yarn. Yes. Like, that kind of stuff really, I'm like, huh. Now I'm just like going to go Google search, like why <laughs> pH changes, like how a fabric accepts or does not accept dye. Yeah, like, that's good. I'm so curious. Yeah, well, I think it's going to change the chemistry of the plant material. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. Not yeah. see, I'm thinking that's changing the like the wool, but of course it's changing the dyed material. Huh. Yeah, didn't think about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I'm a bit speculating there, but I think that's it. That makes sense, though. That it totally does. makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Well, keep us posted. I will. Thank you. And have a super lovely rest of your day. You too. And say hi to Gavin too. I will.